I work at Lockheed Martin mainly because of the mission, right? It's it's not a consumer-centric company. It's really kind of your only opportunity in the Silicon Valley to push technology forward on a scale that you can't in, in a consumer environment. You're working with a very different design methodology, right? Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to make a one-off as opposed to making a million or something, and that one-off has to be as good as it can possibly get. So you're pushing everything you know, you're pushing all the technologies, and it's really just a much different problem set than you would get at a different company in the Bay Area. At Lockheed Martin, I help to develop new technologies in both active and passive sensing, as well as optical communications. Currently, imaging systems for satellites dominate your satellite. They become the dominators in terms of size, weight, and power, and they really become the whole portion of the satellite that matters. The goal with the Spider Imager is to shrink the size of the telescope by 10 to 100 times. So SPIDER stands for the Segmented Planar Imaging Detector for Electro-Optical Reconnaissance. It means that you have a planar imager that takes images interferometrically. It infers what an image would be as opposed to taking the direct image. So the alternative to SPIDER would be more conventional imagers, which would be large, bulky glass optics like we've been doing in the past. Your satellite that took images for your Google Maps when you click the satellite view. That satellite was equivalent to the size of a school bus. The spider imager would be the same diameter, so it would still be very large in diameter because you need a certain imaging resolution. However, it would be much, much thinner from 20 feet to probably a few inches, maybe six to eight inches at most for a full instrument. All right, so this is where we generated the first spider image. There is some lenslets and they're coupled into the front of the photonic circuit. We know that the engineering challenge is really how to do the electronics and how to be able to get them smaller, but it seemed like a lot to bite off at once, which is why we were kind of focusing on the front part, which is the technology piece. Yeah. In the future, what this means is that your instruments and your satellites going to places like Mars would be much more capable and provide much more science in the same space. It could also be used on a drone or in any sort of space weight constrained environment where you want to add imaging capabilities, but you don't want to detract from the overall mission. My name is Nathan Kosla. I'm a researcher here at Lockheed Martin in Palo Alto, and we're in the Nano Copper Lab. What we're developing here is actually called nano copper. We call it a nano structured material. Currently, people use tin solders, they're lead free. The problem is they create what are called tin whiskers, which are little outgrowths that come 90 degrees outside of the solder joint. What they end up doing is shorting two different solder joints and destroying your circuit board. One of the technical fellows here asked, what do I want solder to be made out of? He came up with copper. Everything else in the circuit board's copper. But also copper is the ideal conductor. It has better electrical and thermal conductivity. So this leads to the ability to make new designs to have fewer heat sinks. So what we have here is the nano copper paste. This is what would be the drop-in replacement for solder although we have many other cool uses for it. So I'm just gonna put a little on your finger. If you spread it around and buff it a little, you'll see it maintains its shininess, it looks just like copper, and it's spreadable like toothpaste. How long does it take to make this little bit? Our lab scale process is about four days. And how in terms much of you? The kilogram. So the other applications involve additive manufacturing, printing electronics and antennas specifically. We've done work making flexible substrate, and if sure. you look at it, the chip right there, the connections to it, were printed with nano copper because obviously regular solder is not ideal for flexible applications. Mm -hmm. Once the nano copper technology matured enough that we started looking for business opportunities, Lockheed Martin decided it would be best to help start up a second company, which is called Cuprion, and they handle all of the consumer, the non space, non defense marketing of the nano copper material. We are at the Advanced Technology Center in Palo Alto, California, and this is my graphene workshop. Graphene is carbon, where the carbon atoms have arranged themselves into a two-dimensional plane. So you have a sheet of carbon atoms that's only one atom thick. It's basically atomic scale chicken wire. One of the clips about graphene 
is that it doesn't exist beyond a, an academic laboratory. It's, it does, it's not a real world material yet. And we're trying to change that. We're trying to take graphene out of the laboratory and actually make real materials and real uh, articles out of it. The, the amazing thing about the graphene, the reason it is the world's most efficient membrane, is that you can take this stuff, make it impermeable with the graphene, and then recover almost all of the permeability by putting those nanopores in. As we mature the technology, we can pivot and say, hey, look, we figured out how to make these nanomembranes. Along the way, we now know how to handle graphene. We, we can make chips and things like that. So here's an example. In the middle there, there's a little silicon chip. Sure. The graphene film is now your conductive surface instead of layers and layers of copper and things like that that you would normally make. Lockheed Martin is one of the largest aerospace corporations building satellites completely from the ground up for NASA or the military or the commercial industry and Lockheed's been a huge player in that for many many decades now. We do all this research for new satellites that Lockheed is building and moving forward in the industry. What we do is we expose new materials that people are developing to all the different environments that they would experience on orbit and make sure that they can survive the rigors of space. This is really our charging chamber, so we use it to charge up the surface, kind of like shuffling across the ground in, in socks. This actually gets the same charge as that, which can be upwards of 20,000 volts at times, which is always fairly exciting. If you make a material here on the ground and then send it up and it fails on orbit, you can't get these satellites back. You need to make sure it can survive on the ground before you can launch it up into space. Um, See the big solar simulators in the way right now, so I'll scoot it over. Here, so, so the other system was really our charging system. This is more of our radiation system. This system we have a 100,000 volt electron accelerator. 100,000 volt electrons are about moving around 60% the speed of light. But the really thing that sets this chamber apart is everything from here in the center back. That's all our linear particle accelerator. So we accelerate protons uh, upwards of 2% the speed of light. So this is the only facility of its kind here at Lockheed and one of very few that are actually used for this type of radiation simulation in the entire world. We've really found that there are many opportunities for this type of material to be morphed a little bit into other uses. It smells disgusting. Do you want to take your gloves off?